morning, church. Well, my name's Ben. Uh, I know a lot of you, and I don't know a lot of you. There's a lot of new people here. Um, I'm uh, Pastor Ty's son-in-law. I'm Chris Callahan's son. I'm Hannah's husband. Uh, And the a long time ago, I was a summer intern here for, for two summers, um, so I love, I love being back at Trinity. Um, this, this body has given so much, poured so much into me, so it's just, it's just a joy to be back and to serve, um, and no offense to all of you, but my greatest joy in being here is to give Ty a break. For a uh, that is such a privilege to me. Uh, so I'm going to read our text when Revelation Chapter 2, verses 12 through 17 this morning. I'll read it, I'll pray, then we'll jump in. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, The words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the church what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Word of the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, delivered up by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Oh, Father, we gather in that name this morning. We hear the words of that Jesus. We tremble and we rest. Lord, give me the grace to to preach your word out of rest this morning. May it produce the grace of comfort, encouragement, and repentance among your people. Starting with me, moving outward by your spirit, through your word. Lord, we heed the command this morning to hear what the spirit says to the churches. a soft heart. May we trust our ears more than we trust our eyes this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the second time I've preached through this text, believe it or not. Uh, My church is going through the book of Revelation. We're almost done with it now, uh, but this spring I preached this text. This is the first time I've ever recycled a a sermon. So... um, (laughs) Uh, it's first time for all of us. Thanks for, thanks for having me here to do that. Uh, the first time I was preaching through this text, I was just getting through the book of Joshua in my Bible in a year reading plan. Um, if you haven't ever done that before, just cover to cover. It's beautiful. Give it a shot. Uh, but Joshua is, is an excellent book. 
It's just, it's just a wonderful book. It's this kind of climactic moment in the Bible where after the years of wandering and hardship in the wilderness, Abraham's family is finally standing at the front door to the promised land. The land that God had promised Abraham some 600 years earlier. They crossed the Jordan just like they crossed the Red Sea. They circumcised a new generation, observed the Passover, demonstrating a, a continuance of faithfulness, faithfulness to the covenant, and then they prepare to make war on that formidable border city that's been on the horizon the whole time, Jericho. Well, you all know the story. This was no conventional warfare, was it? The Israelites didn't so much fight the battle as they allowed the Lord to fight the battle. The walls come tumbling down. That's the familiar bit of the story, at least. But what I want us to pay attention to this morning is what happens next. The Bible says that Israel devoted the whole city of Jericho, except for Rahab and her family, to destruction. Do you know what they used to bring about that destruction? Well, the ESV translates it, the edge of the sword. The edge of the sword. And that's a good translation. That's exactly what the, the Hebrew idiom means. It pictures the sword as this kind of devouring force because the actual words are not the edge of the sword, but the mouth of the sword. Israel uses the mouth of the sword to devour Jericho. Joshua 6, that's the first time those words are used, the mouth of the sword, and then they come up over and over again in the story of the Old Testament. The mouth of the sword, when used as God intends it, brings about rest for the faithful and destruction for the wicked. It divides, conquers. The reason I turn us back to the mouth of the sword to start this sermon because I think that's the picture that John is kind of tapping into here when Jesus introduces himself as the one who has the sword coming out of his mouth. He's a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. You see the description in chapter 1, 7, verse 16? Just flip to the other page in your Bible. It says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Jesus doesn't wield the mouth of the sword. He has the sword coming out of his mouth. The things that come out of Jesus' mouth, his words, divide the faithful and the wicked. The things that come out of Jesus' mouth, his words, create rest for the faithful and destruction for the wicked. The Jesus of Revelation comes to conquer comes to conquer on behalf of the faithful and at the expense of the rebel. For our purposes today, in the letter to Pergamum, I think Jesus introduces himself as him who has the sharp two-edged sword because in this very letter, he's bringing about a sort of Joshua and Jericho moment, a confrontation. So in a sentence, I think that this letter communicates that Jesus will give unseen rewards for uncompromising faith. The letter also clearly communicates what Jesus will do for those who compromise. And this is such an important message for Pergamum because there are indeed compromisers in their ranks. Those compromisers need to hear what's at stake. This isn't a game. This isn't a club. This isn't a joke. This is life and death. So he sends this message that he will give unseen rewards for uncompromising faith by doing three things in this letter. First, he honors the perseverance of the believers. Second, he opposes the compromise that's happening in the church in Pergamum. And then third, he promises secret blessings to those who hear his words and hear him well. So three-point sermon this morning. Let's jump in first. Jesus honors perseverance. This is from verse 13. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. and You did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. From what we're told, 
the limited amount that we're told in this letter, Pergamum is not an easy place to be a Christian. It's like they're in a throne room, and the one sitting on the throne, Satan himself. It's become a little tradition of mine to use a Lord of the Rings illustration in every sermon that I give. <laughs> so this is, like, this is like Sam and Frodo when they enter into the last stage of their journey and they're walking through the realms of Mordor. And there looming in the distance is the eye. The evil eye that sees all and destroys all that is opposed to it. And of course, nobody is as opposed to the eye as Sam and Frodo. He looms over the scorched plains of Mordor and makes his presence known. It's not a friendly situation. And indeed, in Pergamum, it's not a friendly situation for Christians. They're living in hostile territory. They are the salt in the wound that Jesus inflicted when he died and rose again. They're a reminder to Satan that his time is limited. He's been cut to the quick, and Christians burn in his wounds. So it's no surprise that one like Antipas, a faithful public witness, was just as publicly killed. It's to these Christians, in this kind of situation, that Jesus delivers these words. He says, I know where you live. I know where you dwell. In other words, he knows your challenges. He knows what it's like to be where you're at. And before I jump in here, I want to give a little, uh, a little tip on interpreting these, these letters in Revelation. Um, I think all of them can kind of hit us, land on us in, on two levels. So first, the one that we're, as like American Christians, the one that we're more familiar with and comfortable with is the individual level. Indeed, Jesus is speaking to each one of us, kind of a heart-to-heart -heart from Jesus in these letters, and we should consider how his words affect our own lives, personally, individually. But then all of these are letters to churches, right? They're letters to communities, to, to cultures, and so we should also seek to apply the letters on the group level, the corporate level, the the church lover level. So as we as we work through here, you'll see me doing that. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring these letters to bear on us as individuals, but then also on us as as a church. And this is a little bit harder for me because this is not my church, and I don't know it as well. But but I'll do my best and just maybe offer some suggestions that you all can think through then. So back into it. First thing Jesus is, says to this hostile territory, Sam and Frodo and Mordor, he says, "I know where you live." He knows your challenges. And how true, how true is this? I mean, just think of the beginning and end of Jesus' ministry. He knows what it's like to be in Satan's presence. He's baptized, receives the Spirit, and what does the Spirit do? Cast him out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Forty days, forty nights, no food, no water, toe to toe with the prince of the power of the air. He knows where you live. Think also of how Jesus' ministry ended. Another brutal showdown with Satan. This time not in a desert, but in a garden. Then in a courtroom. Then on a tree. Jesus knows what it's like to walk through Mordor. So friends, if you feel like you're in hostile territory, feel like the forces of darkness are pressing in on you in your workplace or your hometown or even your home. You're not alone. Rather, you're a Christian. This place where you dwell is not friendly territory. It's hostile. So when the sexual ethics of our day conflict with those of the Bible, when the expectations of the state directly interfere with the commands of Christ, when your mind and body seem to rebel against worship and prayer and God's word, do not be surprised. Do not be discouraged. Do not be deceived into believing that 
you're alone. Jesus knows where you live. He knows your challenges. But he doesn't just know your challenges. He also knows your perseverance. He knows your perseverance. He doesn't just know that you're in a hard place. He knows the way that you stick with it nevertheless. To the church in Pergamum, he praises the strength of their grip, the resolve of their heart. They have held on tight to the name of Jesus, refused to deny the faith that bears his name, Christianity. Even when right before them is displayed the potential cost of faithfulness. They carry on. They stick with it. They're committed at a strong grip. Now, the first time I preached this sermon, we had like a three-month-old, four-month-old puppy named Bear. And at the time, Bear didn't have a very strong grip. Uh, Tug-of-war or play and fetch or whatever. He just, just didn't really grab on to things, you know. But since then, we've found something that Bear really grabs onto. Uh, and that is any kind of dead animal carcass. <laughs> <laughs> Several times on walks, Bear has, has scrounged up a half-decomposed carcass, some kind of rodent or, or whatever. And once that thing gets in his mouth, there's, there's no getting it out. And, you know, to us, it might just look like a carcass. But to Bear, it's obviously something more. It, he either loves the flavor or, or the texture, or maybe it's just the idea that he's a hunter and he has captured prey, you know? Uh, but he's, he's not going to give it up. He, he loves the carcass, and there's, there's no getting it out of his mouth. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to anybody else. It's his, and he's not going to let it go. So, hang on to Jesus like bear hangs on to a carcass, <laughs> I guess. Uh, and, no, the church in Pergamum, they, they've been utterly captivated by Jesus. They, they know the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're not going to let go, despite the circumstances. And Jesus points that out. He says, I know that. I see that. Jesus honors that with his words, memorializes it in the eternal words of the scriptures. And friends, I think, I think this church should be encouraged by these words. I think these words apply to Trinity, both on the individual level and on the corporate level. To teachers here who have been navigating the pronoun issue at school, Jesus knows and he honors you. You businessmen who will not go the extra mile at work, for the sake of your family, for the sake of your church. Jesus knows. He honors you. You mothers who have given up careers and prestige to shoulder the burden of raising children for Jesus. He knows it. And He honors you. You unmarried teenagers, college students, and adults who are holding fast to the name of Jesus rather than the pressing availability of pleasure or companionship with unbelieving significant others. Jesus knows it. He honors you. And to Trinity, the church, about a month ago I was, was here with some guys, some young men who I was taking to camp, and one thing we all noted when we got in the car, talked about how church was. Trinity sings. This is, a, this is a singing church. You don't just gather here and mumble along like it doesn't matter. This church sings like it matters, <laughs> like you believe it, like there's something in your heart that just can't be expressed with a spoken word and needs to be sung, like faith in Jesus is different than anything else you do during the rest of the week. Jesus knows it, and he honors you. This church is the real deal. It's really doing it, and Jesus sees that. As I consider this church and you people, I'm encouraged. I'm inspired in my own struggle 
for faithfulness. So yeah, Jesus knows where you live. He knows how hard it is. But he sees your faithfulness. He honors it. It's not in vain. It's not unnoticed. That's not the end of the letter, is it? It's just the start. Jesus turns now. Remember, Joshua and Jericho moment, there are some inside the walls who are on the wrong side of the sword. So second point, Jesus opposes compromise. This is in verses 14 through 16. But, he says, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols, practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now there's a little bit of an interpretive challenge here in these verses. It's hard to tell whether Jesus is referring to two different groups of false teachers or one group and referring to them by two different names. See what I'm saying? So it's either he's referring to over here the teaching of the Galatians and over here the teaching of Balaam, or it's, it's this one group of people that the, the church in Pergamum knows as the teaching of Nicolaitans, but... Jesus wants them to view that teaching through the lens of the story of Balaam. I think the second option is a better one. I think there's one problem in Pergamum, and they, they know it as the teaching of the Nicolaitans, but, but Jesus is saying, remember Balaam from Numbers? Remember that story? That's what, that's what it's like. That's what's going on here. So to understand it, let's think back to one of the best stories in the Bible. I love the story of Balaam. Balaam is this mercenary prophet. He's a, he's a prophet for hire. And King Balak, as he's standing on his mountain overlooking all of his territory, he sees this massive group of people, the Israelites, marching through the desert towards him. And he's a little intimidated. He's not happy about it. He doesn't want these people. So he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hire Balaam to call down curses on this new people, but I'm going to have him do it in the name of their own God. <laughs> I'm going to have him use their own God against them. So he goes, finds Balaam. Balaam's resistant at first. He's like, I don't know if the Lord's going to like that that much, but eventually he convinces him, and three times Balaam tries to curse the people of Israel. In his heart, there's a curse from the Lord, but as it comes out of his mouth, the Lord turns it into a blessing. Which, no surprise, this is his covenant people. He's not going to curse them from some missionary, mercenary prophet. <laughs> no surprise, but Balak is frustrated. Evil king Balak, the king of the Midianites, he's mad and he kind of chastises Balaam. And we think we're done with Balaam. But we're not done with Balaam yet in the book of Numbers. Balak brings on Balaam as a kind of advisor, kind of a, a counselor. How are we going to deal with this big group of people that's encroaching on our territory? And Balaam comes up, comes up with an idea. He tells Balak to just send some of his women into the camp of Israel. He says, if you do that, that will be their undoing. Rather than using supernatural means to curse the people, to turn the Lord against them, he devised a way to use natural means to accomplish the same goal. See, the women would wander into the camp of Israel and entice them into physical union, what Jesus calls here sexual immorality. And that 
physical union would inevitably lead to spiritual union, what Jesus calls eating food sacrificed to idols, participating in the idolatrous feasts of the Midianites. So the teaching of Balaam for the people of Israel, for the men to hold to the teaching of Balaam, was for them literally to hold the women who were sent into the camp upon Balaam's instruction. This was such a big deal because the Lord demanded faithfulness from his people. They were not to worship other gods. And he knew from the beginning that intermarrying with idolatrous nations would produce idolatry within them. So he said, you can't do it. You must not do it. So the teaching of Balaam is compromised. The teaching of Balaam is to be duped into worshiping other gods by way of the sights and sounds and scents of exotic women. The teaching of Balaam, which is the same as the teaching of the Nicolaitans, is not a set of doctrines that you can either affirm or deny. It's an attitude. It's a spirit. It's a casualness, licentiousness, foolishness. It's a disregard for the clear instruction of the Lord. Here's what it is. It's an approach to life that assumes one's own ability to stop sinning before sinning too sinfully. An approach to life that assumes one's own ability to stop sinning before one starts sinning too sinfully. It assumes God's willingness to overlook offenses that are, in our own eyes, understandable, justifiable, reliably harmless. Friends, I really believe that Jesus wants us to see that we have this kind of spirit in us. The teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans is alive and well in this day and age, both on the individual level and on the church level. First, as individuals, in each one of us, there can be this casual attitude of compromise. We've all got sins that we just haven't gotten around to hating yet. So maybe we watch shows with flagrant sexual immorality. We justify it by saying that it tells an important story or has a good overall message. Perhaps we're enticed to bitterness and disunity by our constant scrolling of Facebook. But we justify it because it's the only way to keep up with the kids or... Stay informed. Perhaps we gossip in the workplace. Justify it, saying we're just building relationships with our coworkers. It's this casual attitude of compromise. It is a slippery slope. Compromise does produce more compromise. It did in the days of Balaam. It is in the church in Pergamum. And it will here today. And let's be honest, as a church, there are lots of reasons we might become casual toward compromise. This is supposed to be a place where we love one another so much that we do not allow each other to walk in sin. We bring it into the light. We might be healed. And yet can be easy to overlook the compromises in our brothers and sisters. It can be easy to allow them to smuggle foreign women into camp, especially when we just did the same thing last night. It's easy for churches to develop blind spots and for subtle sins to become a part of their culture. I don't know Trinity well enough to apply this specifically, but Here are a few kinds of compromises that I think are common in Midwestern rural churches like this one. Churches like Trinity can become ingrown, never sharing Jesus with unbelievers, fostering this kind of self-righteous exclusivism that just rejects the mission that Jesus gave us to make disciples. Churches like this one can get clicky. We find comfortable relationships 
and then disconnect from the rest of the church in a way that simply erodes the unity that Jesus died to buy and rose to pour out on his people. This is a common one. I think we can become hearers of the word and not doers. Attending Bible studies, taking sermon notes, learning theology. These things can replace actual obedience. They can replace confession and repentance. And on and on the list goes. The teaching of the Nicolaitans is not an anomaly in Pergamum. It's a human reality. Across all times, in this world that we live in, compromise is easy. It's the default mode. And yet, Jesus hates it. He will not tolerate it. The sword of his mouth comes for this kind of an attitude. So we must hate it. We cannot tolerate it. This January, I went to Cross Conference in Louisville, Kentucky. I would really recommend that to anybody, by the way, if you're looking for a conference. But Rosaria Butterfield, one of the speakers there, said this thing that will stick with me forever. She said, sin never stays where you put it. Sin never stays where you put it. To expand the metaphor a little bit, many of us put sin in a closet, put it on top shelf, put sin in the basement, sin in the garage. Because we don't really want it to be out in the open. We don't really want to deal with it on a day-to-day basis, and yet we don't really want to get rid of it either. Pet sins. Sins that we stockpile. But what Rosaria Butterfield says, and what I think the teaching of the Nicolaitans proves, is that that sin multiplies. And it moves. And it grows. It, It will not stay where you put it. The only solution is to actually kill it dead. To actually get rid of it. So, maybe if you would with me, just Take 30 seconds and reflect on your life. Where is the teaching of Balaam in your life? Jesus is very clear in verse 16. We must repent. Dear friend, if you're holding tight onto Jesus, your hands are full. You don't have room for anything else. There's no room for saving sin or saving face here today. This is an either-or situation. It's a Joshua and Jericho moment. Either you're outside the walls or you're inside. You're either vindicated by the sword or you're devoured by it. So in love, I ask you, repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. If you don't, Jesus says, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. That's not the end of the letter either. Finally, Jesus promises secret blessings. Verse 17. He who has an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Jesus promises two blessings at the end of this letter. And they really match up. They kind of contrast with the things that he said earlier in a a beautiful way. But before we look at that, let's just notice the way that Jesus connects these promises with a command. The command is this. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
In other words, if the reader of Revelation would just faithfully accept and apply what Jesus has said above, he will give him the blessings that he's about to name. But notice, notice. The blessings don't come to the one who reads or to the one who comprehends or to the one who attends the church service on the Sunday that it is preached. The blessings come to the one who uses the ears of their soul to hear. So hear this morning. Now, both of these blessings, here's what I want to point out. Both of them are shrouded in mystery. It's not just manna. It's, it's hidden manna. It's, it's secret manna. And it's not just a white stone. It's a stone with a new name written on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. And I think Jesus is drawing a contrast here between the obvious and visible opposition that the people are facing. There's a throne and Satan is on it. There's foreign women walking through the camp. But if the people would just trust their, trust their ears, trust what Jesus says is going to happen, if they would remain faithful despite the visible temptations to walk away, to deny, to let go, then they would receive the blessings. Now, there's a lot of symbolism tied up in these two blessings, but I want to point out kind of the timeline behind each one. The first blessing, the manna, is a daily blessing, but the, the stone is an eternal one, a lasting blessing. So Jesus promises two secret blessings. The first one is daily bread, the hidden manna. Now, if you remember back to Exodus, probably the defining characteristic of manna was its dailiness right? I mean, you could not hoard manna for tomorrow. What happens if you try? It's worse than if you hadn't, <laughs> right? You can't stockpile manna. You can't access tomorrow's manna. Every morning, the Lord provided exactly one day's worth of manna, and that was the point. Manna required faith. In God's promise, there was nothing visible to show that manna would come tomorrow. They didn't see manna clouds rolling in off the horizon every night when they went to bed. They had to go to bed believing that the word of the Lord was true. That he would provide for them the next day. And so it is with us. We don't remain uncompromising in our faith by seeing the blessings coming. We remain uncompromising because we believe that whatever provision we need, whether it's freedom from trial or faith for the trial, that provision will be there in the morning. We remain steadfast because there's a table we cannot see, laden with heavenly food, and we will feast on it forever when the Lamb comes to take His bride. And secondly, the Lord promises a precious stone Manna is daily, but stones are permanent. If we continue in repentance and faith, our stone is white. It's pure. It's precious. And it bears a name on it that is a cherished secret between the giver and the receiver. Between us and our Savior. And in the Bible, names are not just names. Names are identity. Your name is who you are. So when Jesus gives us a new name, he makes us a new kind of person. And this name is not written on parchment or drawn in the sand because it's not the kind of name that is burned by fire or swept away by flood. It's not that kind of name because we're not that kind of people. Even though our faithfulness is short and weak, we will remain forever, sustained by hidden manna, holding fast to the name of Jesus. He promises us a stone with a new name. So what will it be this morning, church? Will we persevere for the blessings we cannot yet see? 
Or will we compromise? Because we're scared of the throne of Satan or enticed by the foreign women. And as we close, let's avoid a, an important mistake. Let's not think that this is some kind of transaction where we earn the blessings of Jesus with our faithfulness. Church, let's be honest. If that was the arrangement, none of us would be getting blessings. Because we're not that kind of people. We're compromisers. In our bones, in our DNA. So no, our faithfulness does not earn Jesus' ble blessings. Actually, our faithfulness is a blessing that Jesus earned in his death and resurrection. Let me say that again. Our faithfulness does not earn blessings. Actually, our faithfulness is a blessing that Jesus earned in his death and resurrection. Our compromises were cleansed on the cross. Our steadfastness was secured in the resurrection. Our daily faithfulness was poured out at Pentecost in the person of the Spirit. So yes, these are blessings that produce more blessings. They are seeds that bear fruit. And yet, all growth comes from above. If it weren't for the work of Jesus, we would not stand. So if you're here this morning, and you have yet to believe the gospel, you've yet to trust Jesus for your forgiveness and your future. This whole message has been pointless for you because you cannot remain faithful. You have not the Spirit of God. You must be born again. You got to get up on the cross with Jesus through repentance. If you've not repented this morning, the sword of Jesus is sharp. And I beg you to get on the right side of it. If you're in Christ this morning, if you're in Christ this morning, this letter is not meant to scare you. Christian, you don't have to be afraid of compromise. But you do have to be aware of it. Certainly, Jesus will not fail you and the Spirit will transform you from one degree of glory to the next, but He will do so through your conscious choices to reject the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. <clears throat> Christian, daily bread is yours today, so eat up. Savor it. If you put something else in your mouth this morning, spit that garbage out. And eat some daily manna. Christian, you have a new name etched in stone. So jump into the mystery of its meaning, of its power. Learn how to say it. You are not identified by your vices, your occupation, your relationship status, or the size of your house. It's not who you are. You've been given a new name. So imagine how somebody with that new name would live Go live that life. Trinity, you're not a social club or an educational institution. You're the church of Jesus Christ, commissioned by Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations because he's with you and he knows where you live. So imagine how a church like that would live and go live it this week. What a privilege, what a blessing, and what a solemn charge for Jesus. Go and live that life. He knows where you dwell. and He promises secret blessings. Let's pray. Lord, I trust that this is the message we need this morning. That these good people saved by the blood of Jesus need what he says. So for those who are about to lose their grip, may they be convinced again that you know where they live. You honor their perseverance. 
For those who have been playing with fire, who have been flirting with the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, wake them up. Open their ears to what the Spirit says to the churches. May they catch a glimpse of the sword that comes out of your mouth and repent. Lord Jesus, give us faith to believe in the secret blessings that we can't see but we do hear for provision for today and an eternity's worth of a new identity in Christ. Precious white stone. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.